message is actually titled, God is Sovereign. We want to try to understand what does that mean, that God is sovereign, that God is in control, that God oversees all things. And there's tension with God's sovereignty, isn't there, and our personal will. In fact, there's tension because as we see things happening in our world, sometimes uh, there's crisis that occurs around us. And how do we understand that God is sovereign when, when we're experiencing a crisis? When our seven-year-old nephew died, was it because God needed him in heaven? It's interesting what we say to people when they're going through a grief. Sometimes because we don't know what to say, we say some really dumb things. Well, he's better off there than he is here. Tell that to his mother who wanted to still hug him. Well, God needed him up there. Isn't this the God that has the power to do anything? So what's he need a little seven-year-old for? You see, it's, it's a challenge, isn't it, for us as we go through life. And, and the challenge also is, is that then we start to kind of ask God some questions, don't we? <laughs> Job had some pretty painful experiences that he went through. All of his children died, sons and daughters. Slaves and ser servants that he had were killed and died. He himself was suffering from boils and ugh, some just nasty, painful things and all that he was, that he was going through. It's no wonder then that as uh, his friends, I guess you call them that, his friends who kept saying, you know, in fact, his wife was the biggest friend of all, curse God and die, Job, you know, like, you know, this is bad, you know, just give it up. His friends are, okay, what did you do, Job? You must have done something really bad to have deserved all this stuff. Listen to part of God's response to Job, who fell into some of the questioning himself. And Job 38 says, Then the Lord answered Job out of the storm. It's interesting, even the context that God's going to use for this. In the midst of the storm, as life is raging around Job, God now responds to Job. Who is this that darkens my counsel with words without knowledge? Brace yourself like a man. I will question you and you will answer me. Where were you when I laid the earth's foundation? Tell me if you understand. Who marked off its dimensions? Surely you know. Who stretched a measuring line across it? Or what were its footings set or, or who laid its cornerstone? While the morning stars sang together and all the angels shouted for joy. Who shut up the sea behind doors when it burst forth from the womb? When I made the clouds its garment and wrapped it in thick darkness, when I fixed limits for it and set its doors and bars in place. When I said, this is far, this far you may come and no farther. Here is where your proud waves halt. Have you ever given orders to the morning or shown the dawn its place? that it might take the earth by the edges and shake the wicked out of it? The earth takes shape like clay under a seal. Its features stand out like those of a garment. The wicked are denied their light, and their unpraised arm is broken. Have you journeyed to the springs of the sea or walked in the recesses of the deep? Have the gates of death been shown to you? Have you seen the gates of the shadow of death? Have you comprehended the vast expanses of the earth? Tell me if you know all this. What is the way to the abode of light? And where does darkness re reside? Can you take them to their places? Do you know the paths to their dwellings? Surely you know, for you were already born. You've lived so many years. Have you entered the storehouses of the snow or seen the storehouses of the hail, which I reserve for times of trouble, for days of war and battle? What is the way to the place where the lightning is dispersed or the place where the east winds are scattered over the earth? Who cuts a channel for the torrents of rain and a path for the thunderstorm? 
to water a land where no man lives, a desert with no one in it, to satisfy a desolate wasteland and make it sprout with grass. Does the rain have a father who fathers the drops of dew? From whose womb comes the ice? Who gives birth to the frost from the heavens? When the waters become hard as stone, when the surface of the deep is frozen, can you bind the beautiful Pleiades? Can you loose the cords of Orion? Can you bring forth the constellations in their seasons or lead out the bear with its cubs? He's talking about the stars, right? Do you know the laws of the heavens? Can you set up God's dominion over the earth? Can you raise your voice to the clouds and cover yourself with a flood of water? Do you send the lightning bolts on their way? Do they report to you? Here we are. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Who endowed the heart with wisdom or gave understanding to the mind? Who has the wisdom to count the clouds? Who can tip over the water jars of the heavens when the dust becomes hard and the clods of earth stick together? Do you hunt the prey for the lioness and satisfy the hunger of the lions when they crouch in their dens or lie in wait in a thicket? Who provides food for the raven when its young cry out to God and wander about for lack of food? God, we're well aware that we're in a state that uh, continues to struggle with, um, with, with drought, with some very serious water issues and needs. And we're also very well aware of God that that in our own strength and might and in all of the power and ability we have on this land, we do not have the ability to force rain to fall here in Southern California. When, when the east is getting battered by storm after storm, and it's the coldest and worst winter they've had in decades, we sit here in the sunlight and, and bask in the warmth. And for many, we celebrate that and are thankful for it and too many actually are hoping that just they can enjoy that sunlight without realizing how serious the drought is and yet what one of us what nation what leader who even is considered one of the greatest powers on earth what power here can draw the reins or what power even design the reins lord god there is much that we do not understand. And we do have questions, God. Help us today as we ask our questions of you to understand that you are greater than maybe what even we can totally comprehend. That you have power and resources available to us that go beyond our imagination. And Lord, in, in that, then may we stop questioning for a moment. And trust that you are God of heaven and earth, creator of the universe, the giver of life, and the one who is here right now because you love us. Oh, God, how great you are. Is this tension that we have between God's sovereignty, his rule, his control, the fact that he is working things together for good, um, the, the, the phrase to be sovereign means uh, all things are under God's rule and control. God has the absolute right to do all things according to his own good pleasures. We're going to see in our text some pretty, I should warn you, challenging questions that God's going to ask back to us. How many of us have ever said, God, why are you doing this? Okay, a few of you have. So the rest of you have just have faithfully submitted to everything God has told you, right? No. So some of you just didn't answer the first time. Is that, that it? Submission, <laughs> submission to God's rule and God's authority is a challenge for us as humans. I gotta think that it's even more challenging for Americans. 
This is the land of the free and the brave, the self-made people. We've accomplished so much, and we're going to do more. We're first to the moon and first in all the gold medals. We had the first gold medal in this Winter Olympics. Did you know that? That's because we're so wonderful and great and mighty and and godlike. Any of you ever looked in the mirror when you were a teenager? God, why'd you make me like this? <laughs> You're not checking with the God who is the ruler of the heavens and the earth and saying he blew it? Think about it. When we look at ourselves now, now let's face it, I've contributed to some of the ways I look. Right? Right? <laughs> I've eaten a little more than I should, <laughs> exercised a little less than I should, and I'm aging, okay? And so I contribute to the way that I look. I decide whether I'm going to have a beard, right, or not, and how I'm going to cut my hair, even how I'm going to comb it. So I actually contribute to the ways I look. Um, I can, I'll just tell you this real quick. When, when we were kids, we only took a bath once a week. But at least it was on Saturday night, so when you saw us on Sunday, we didn't stink. <laughs> Don't know what I was like on Monday through Friday, though. Oh, my goodness. I contribute to the way I look <laughs> and the way I smell, too, huh? And yet, look at this. Look at this. How often have we looked at God and said, why would you make me like this? How often have we looked at somebody else and said, God, why didn't you give me what you gave them? How come you didn't give me the resources, the abilities? Or how come you're giving me this? Why does this back have to still hurt? Because you ran into a tree, stupid. <laughs> See, there again, God had nothing to do with it, did he? <laughs> so. Yes, he did. He saved you. you <laughs> but did he make me run into the tree? No. Okay. <laughs> Although, if he's a sovereign God... Uh, Carol, if he's a sovereign God, maybe he did make me run into that tree for some reason that I don't know. Like what happened with Joseph, right? God did not entice the brothers to prepare to murder and then send him into slavery. But what God promises is that God's going to work good out of the evil meant by man. So there's this tension that we have, and it's at play. And here's where the tension really gets strongest. There's a tension between God's sovereignty, his rule, his ability to do what he wants to do, and for him, excuse me, to accomplish his purposes, and a tension with our free will. Have you felt the tension? A tension between God saying, I want all to be saved and come to me, but God, God giving us free will to choose this day whom we will serve and we get the option. That, that tension between God died because he loved the whole world and God wants no one to perish but he allows us to choose to not come to him. <coughs> There's a tension between God's sovereignty and God's free will. Well, let's take a glance at Romans chapter 9 and uh, we're going to look at verse 19, 20, and 21. Paul is talking here in, in this section of Romans. He's talking to the Roman church about the, the choices that we make. And he actually is going to be referring to Pharaoh and how Pharaoh made choices. Now, as you look at Scripture, you're going to see a couple things that happened with Pharaoh. Pharaoh actually, it says, Pharaoh hardens his heart. And then at another place, it says that God hardens Pharaoh's heart. Now, once um, Pharaoh gets to this place where he's just, he's not going to let these people go, then God hardens his heart so that he can go through the full list of plagues that he has promised that's going to occur, ultimately to get to that Passover lamb, which will take away the sins of the world, that, that pre-Christ event that's taking place clear back with the children of Israel, getting us ready for the Christ event when, as John said it, behold the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And so Pharaoh gets his hardened heart. Jesus will talk about something like this in another spot too, won't he? 
In fact, he explains why he talks in parables. He tells them stories because he says, look, this is, this is precious, and, and I need to give it to people who really want to understand it, who really want to receive it. But unfortunately, some of you are going to harden your hearts. Some of you are going to reject it. And then he says, because you are rejecting it, I'm going to harden your heart so that once Later, seeing you will not be able to perceive, hearing you will not be able to understand. I'm going to actually harden your heart. Why? Because of your heart's hardfulness, hardness. Now watch out, folks, because we're vulnerable to this, to, to this today as well. We're vulnerable because we all know Jesus. We all know all about God. We know everything that's needed to know, right? <laughs> well, we think we do. And we, every day we come to worship, every time we go to God's word, are vulnerable to looking at that word with a hard heart. And here's how you know you got a hard heart is when you walk away and you did nothing about what you just read. Test yourself. Because you really find out whether somebody's listening by what we do. <laughs> When, when Debbie asks me to remember to stop and pick up something at the grocery store, she knows I did it when I bring it home, not when I come home and say, I forgot. <laughs> okay. See, I could have heard, I could have written it down, but I really haven't listened until I followed through and do, done something about what I heard. Folks, we need to be in prayer that we don't develop hard hearts. So, so did you see the song that we just sang? And we repeated it several times, didn't we? With a picture there of the potter uh, working on the clay. And we said, change my heart, oh God. Now here's what's really sad. This was when God-fearing, God-loving people sing a song like that, pray a prayer like that, and don't really mean it. So I'm asking you, for your sake today, pray that you don't have a hard heart. Pray that you're open to what God's trying to say to you this day and every day. So then having talked about Pharaoh, who's hardened his heart, he then comes to verse 19 and says, One of you will say to me, then why does God still blame us? For who resists his will? But who are you, O oh man, to talk back to God? Ouch. Oh, ouch. Shall what is formed say to him who formed it, why did you make me like this? Uh, yeah, we do that a lot, don't we? Does not the potter have the right to make out of the same lump of clay some pottery for noble purposes and some for common use? God, we need you to empower this word to influence and change our lives. We, we need you to convict us, God. We need your Holy Spirit to soften up the hard spots in our heart where maybe we're not open to obeying you and doing your will. And yet, God, help us to deal with that tension today. Because I thank you, God, that that when there's a sincere person asking you a question, you always respond in love. I thank you, God, that, that, that when, when somebody is hurting and crying out, that, that you respond with comfort and peace. You, you respond with your presence. I thank you, God, that it's in those painful moments when we've shaken our fist at heaven because we don't understand and the pain is more intense than we can comprehend, when we see no relief from it, when there's the questions of why and how and what's going to happen now are left unanswered and silent, Lord, that in those moments that even though we may be crying out to you and we may sound like we're like this person in Romans who's questioning you, that it's in those moments, God, that when we're sincere, when we're hurting, that you don't respond with judgment, that instead you respond with love. And I pray, God, today for sincere questions and for faith that you are here and you will speak to us. In Jesus' name, amen. See, who are, who are we to resist God's will? He says, one of you will say to me, then why, 
Why does God still blame us for who resists his will? We resist his will, yes? Sadly, if we're going to be very honest about it. Do you remember what Jesus was praying as he's hanging on the cross? Some would say he's probably quoting Psalm 22. And, and as you look at Psalm 22, you'll actually find many of the phrases that Jesus states on the cross are found right there in Psalm 22, which is an amazing thing. That hanging there in all the excruciating pain, what's he remembering? The word of God, the prophecies of his own death. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I, I, I needed to point that out because as we look at this passage, God's not saying you can't have a question, okay? And you, may not, and you may even have a very desperate question because it was okay for Jesus to hang on the cross and say, God, God, why? Why have you forsaken me now? Why am I alone now? Because God was turning his back on him and Jesus was feeling it. The pain that Jesus is going through on that cross is more excruciating than what he was feeling physically. He's actually feeling this separation. He just prayed about this. You remember it? He just prayed about how this incredible oneness that he feels with the Father and with the Holy Spirit and how, how, how much strength he's drawing from that and that it's so important that we be one like they are one. And, and now he's being ripped apart. The father love that he's experienced throughout eternity is being separated for a period of time. And it's horrible to the one hanging there on the cross, to the living word of God. It's horrible to the God-man who's now experiencing the pain of humanity. And not only that, but as he's experiencing this pain, he's taking on the sins of the world on himself. And so God has to turn his back on his own son and look away from him. And there's distance in heaven like it's never been experienced in all of eternity. And it's the distance that will purchase our forgiveness and new life for all of us who will choose to believe. Who are we to resist his will? <clears throat> we stand in front of the mirror or we go through life and why have you made me this way, God? That's really what we're saying when we're asking about things that are happening to us. <laughs> the second and third and the fourth and 90th time we've sinned and done the same thing again. Why am I like this? You know, oh God, how come you made me like this? You know, wouldn't you have been better off, God, if you made me a little bit less giving in to sin? You know, we'd be all better off, wouldn't we? Make me a little less human, God. <laughs> Why have you made me the way I am? with the passions, the interests, with the gifts, with the challenges, with the weakness, the shortcomings, the heartaches. Why have you put the things into my life that you've put into my life? Why do you have me born into this particular family? You ever done some of that philosophical wrestling? What if you had been born into some other family? I was thinking about yesterday, 39 years. 39 years we celebrated our anniversary yesterday. Wow. And on my anniversary card, Debbie said, thank you for not leaving me. Because 30 years ago, I almost did. And in a lot of ways, I left her. And I got thinking this, I think it was this morning or last night. Philip was born after we renewed our relationship. If I don't, if I don't come back, if I don't repent, if Debbie and I don't come back together, is there a Philip? There's a philosophical one for you. Is there a Philip, Andrew Mellinger? And if there's not a Philip, Andrew Mellinger, does Jen come to know Jesus? Because Philip is the one that built a friendship with Jen. And Jen started coming to our house, and Jen accepted, accepted Christ because of what she saw in Philip. 
And if there's not a Jan accepting Christ, where, what about the rest of that line of things that have happened because of both of their influences? You know, they're both small group leaders at their church. I'm working with young couples and all. They're helping with the youth at their church. Kids are coming to know Christ because of stuff they're doing. They, do you know that Philip was a part of a group on campus that was a Christian fraternity at the University of Southern California, folks? And there he witnessed for Jesus Christ in all different kinds of ways. Who else is, has come to know Christ? And who else would not have? Oh, Lord. If, if I had gone down my path of sin, God is sovereign. It's incredible. And God allowed, I had the free choice to stay in my marriage or not stay in it. I had the free choice, don't we? You can, you can sin if you want to. You can disobey God. You can go against his will. And what does he promise? Here's the amazing thing. He's, he's still pro this promise still holds true, that God will work things together for good to those who love him or are called according to his purposes. Here's another thing that's true, that when you sin, if you truly repent and you confess and you're honest about it, you come back to him, he will do what? He will forgive you and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. He will make you into a brand new creation. Old things will pass away. All things will become new. Names that you've worn on your forehead, what does Revelation say? He's going to give us a brand new name. Because we've worn names on our forehead. I know I've worn that one of that fat, chubby, willy guy. That, um, okay, Crash and all those other kinds of things that they used to call me. I've worn all kinds of names up here and all. And yet God has a new name for each one of us. And so that even if I had sinned and continued going down a path and turned away from him, whenever I came back, what did the story of the prodigal teach me? That if, even when I come back, if if I choose to come back, that he's going to be waiting there for me to come back. The saddest thing about the story of the prodigal is that the real prodigal was the elder son who was next to dad and didn't enjoy him. See, that's why people dislike, the, the, the Pharisees disliked the story of the prodigal because they understood that the pro story of the prodigal was about them and that they weren't the younger one who had left. They were the older one who was still there. They were the religious people who were sitting in church and not really loving the God who loved them. They were people like, like us. God, why have you made me this way? <laughs> and how does Paul respond? He says, doesn't the potter have a right over the clay? <laughs> Can you imagine clay talking? Oh, oh, don't squeeze me that way. Don't touch me there. No, no, you're, oh, you're doing it wrong. Turn it the other way. Oh, no, don't you dare. No, don't you dare open me up like that. No, don't put your hands inside there like that. No, I'm not going to be that kind of a pot. What do you mean this is what we're going to do? I've got a lot better purposes in my life than what you're making right now. You're blowing it. Can you imagine the conversations that God must be hearing from us? Oh, Lord, help us. Doesn't? The potter have the right over the clay. The potter, who's the potter? Well, obviously we are. <laughs> no. God is the potter. The Lord, this is from Proverbs 16, verse 4, and then 9, and then 33. Proverbs 16. The Lord works out everything to its proper end, even the wicked for a day of disaster. Verse 9, in their hearts, humans plan their course. Yeah. <laughs> but the Lord establishes their steps. Jesus said, why are you planning on where you're going to go tomorrow when you don't even know how long you're going to live? <laughs> right? So seek first his kingdom today. Or verse 33, the lot is cast into the lap, but it's every decision is from the Lord. He, even if you're trying to do something by a more or less magical way, and you're going to cast a lot to try to understand what God's will is, God is going to accomplish his purposes. Several from the Psalms, Psalm 115, verse 3 says, Our God is in heaven. He does whatever pleases him. Thank God. Because you see, God sees things in ways I don't see things. 
God understands life in ways that I don't understand. And I may be certain, like I was more than once, about the girl that I was supposed to marry. Oh, I was, oh, yeah. Yeah, I was 16, and she was 14, and she had long, blondish hair, straight and everything, and uh, that's who I was supposed to marry. You know, <laughs> I still can't believe that Stan Roberts listened to me as I told him that. <laughs> And, and how, how madly I was in love was with, was with this girl. And uh, <laughs> it all ended because that wasn't the right person. And, and I've, I've had a view of God, what's best for my life all throughout my life, haven't I? <laughs> I decide that things are, would be better a certain way. And so I pray that way, do any of you? <laughs> okay, God, this is, this is the way I want it to go. I want you to do this and this and this, as if he doesn't understand what's right. <laughs> Are we dumb? <laughs> All right, God, maybe you didn't see this clearly because you were busy in another part of heaven, okay? <laughs> You're building a few more stars out there or something. I don't know what it is, God, but so I just thought I'd help you out a little bit here. <laughs> oh, my goodness. <laughs> Isn't that kind of foolish? Doesn't the potter have a right over the clay. Psalm 135, verse 6, the Lord does whatever pleases him in the heavens and on the earth, in the seas and all their depths. Isaiah 29, 16, you turn things upside down, cool, as if the potter were thought to be like the clay. Shall what is formed say to the one who formed it, you did not make me. Can the pot say to the potter, you know nothing? <laughs> That's kind of what we're doing, though, isn't it? In so many different ways. As we're talking to God, as we're trying to get him to do what we want, we're saying, you just don't understand it, Mr. Potter. So let the clay tell you what to do. Isaiah 45, verse 9. Woe to those who quarrel with their maker. Mm. Those who are nothing but pots herds among the pots herds on the ground. Uh, that's not a good thing. Does the clay say to the potter, what are you making? <laughs> Does your work say the potter has no hands? This is what the Lord says, verse 11. The Holy One of Israel and its maker concerning things to come. Do you question me about my children or give me orders about the work of my hands? It is I who made the earth. And created mankind on it. My own hands stretched out the heavens. I marshaled their starry hosts. Or it's Isaiah 64, verse 8. 64, 8, Isaiah. Yet you, Lord, are our Father. We are the clay. You are the potter. We are all the work of your hand. Is that the way you go to God? I should warn us, the sovereign Lord will punish sin. Amos chapter 3 says, Hear this word, people of Israel, the word the Lord has spoken against you, against the whole family. I brought you up out of Egypt. You only have I chosen of all the families of the earth. Therefore, I will punish you for all your sins. Oh, uh-oh. Verse 6, when a trumpet sounds in a city, do not the people tremble? When disaster comes to a city, has not the Lord caused it? The trumpet would sound as enemies were attacking. And he might wake you up in the middle of the night and, uh-oh, you were afraid. Verse 11 of Amos 3. Therefore, this is what the sovereign Lord says. An enemy will overrun your land, pull down your strongholds, and plunder your fortresses. On the day I punish Israel for her sins. I will destroy the altars of Bethel, the horns of the altar, and will be cut off and fall to, will be cut off and will fall to the ground. Lamentations says in chapter three. I'm going to read it a couple places, 37 to 39, and then 55 to 57. Who can speak and have it happen <laughs> if the Lord has not decreed it? Because if you've got that power, please go outside right now and just say rain. <laughs> you don't even have to say snow. I don't mind if you do, but... 
just go out there, and if you have the ability to control things, do it, folks. If you're not, why aren't you? <laughs> okay? If you've got the ability. Is it not from the mouth of the Most High that both calamities and good things come? And here, the writer of Lamentations opens up our other tension, doesn't it? God's at work around us, yet bad things happen to good people. How many tragedies have we watched over the last several years? Shootings in theaters, on campuses. The number of children that die of starvation, malnutrition. There's tragedy all around this world. So if God is sovereign, why is he allowing it? Well, he is actually going to punish sin. Warren Wiersbe tells the following story. He says, I recall sharing in a street meeting in Chicago and passing out tracts at the corner of um, Madison and Kedzie. Anybody from Chicago know the corner? Okay, sorry. Anyways, most of the people graciously accepted the tracts, but one man took the tract and with a snarl crumpled it up and threw it in the gutter. The name of the tract was Four Things God Wants You to Know. There are a few, th here's how the man responded. He said, there's a few things I want God to know. Why is there so much sorrow and tragedy in this world? Why do the innocent suffer while the rich go free? Don't tell me there's a God. If there is, then God is the biggest sinner that ever lived. And he turns away with a sneer on his face and gets lost in the crowd. We are in a world in which people are suffering and people see that suffering and want to know why and don't understand that if there is this loving God out there who says he cares, then why isn't he fixing this stuff? Do you know one of the, one of the reasons why he's not fixing it? Because he's waiting for some people still to come to him. In fact, the reason why God might not be fixing this world could actually be about one of you here this morning. He desires that none should perish, but that all should come to life and forgiveness and have a relationship, a relationship with him. And he knows that there could very well be some of you here who have been very religious, talk the talk even, maybe even looked like you walked the walk, but Jesus is not in a personal relationship inside your heart. He knows that. And because of that, he longs for you to come to him, and because he longs for you to come to him, he holds back. Parents do that. They watch children and they, they hold back, you know. Now, hopefully you don't do what, what my parents would do. Okay. Teach you how to avoid the flame, they put your hand in the fire. <laughs> so we got burned, okay? But, but isn't there another place where sometimes you just have to watch the child? It's one of the reasons why, incidentally, God made children little so that they, when they fall, they don't have to fall so far, okay? <laughs> See, there's, God understands, and parents understand that sometimes you've got to make it, let, allow them to make some mistake in order to learn from even the, those choices that they're making. And God's doing that, and God's waiting because God wants no one to perish. Because here's the problem, folks, is that when God judges and he says he will punish evil, he will punish sin, he's going to actually, in fact, this is what Revelation tells us, he's actually going to destroy Satan, he's going to destroy the last and worst enemy, which is what? death. Interesting. He's going to destroy that one he refers to as the enemy, which is death. And death has been taking numerous lives, right? But by the way, don't forget, death's not the end. So he says, I'm going to destroy these enemies. And so Revelation gives us this great news. I'm going to destroy the enemies. But when he destroys them and the end comes, it's a dividing line. And there will be those who will be on this side who said, no, I don't want God. And he'll say, okay, you don't have to go to heaven with me. This is not about a loving God choosing not to allow people in. This is about a righteous God saying, I will not force anyone to be with me for an eternity when they don't want to be. You could be why 
Christ has not returned and God has not ended the battle of evil because he's waiting for you to truly turn over every part of your life to Jesus Christ. I wish I could remember where I got these five points from, and um, I can't, and I, for some reason, didn't put it in my notes, but they're excellent, so I'm going to share them with you anyways. I want to encourage you to ponder the mystery of pain and evil. Number one, God did not create pain and evil. Do you know where it came from? God created a world that did not have pain and evil. And what happened? Man sinned against God and invited in that process. This is why Satan comes as the tempter. He comes in order to draw people away from God and for him to get control over this earth. He's the small G-O-D, God of this earth. And he got that right because the world gave it to him with that original sin. God didn't create the evil. Now... Uh, somebody's going to say, but he created the angel, uh, Lucifer, the, who Satan, right? And who fell from, yes, he did. But he didn't create within him that passion to leave God. He created within him a passion to worship God, to honor God, as he's created in us as well, a hunger for God. Secondly, though suffering isn't good, God can use it to accomplish good. Just think and ponder about that, okay? You look back on some of the experiences in your own life, And you'll see, if you look carefully, that God has been, if you've allowed him to, that God has used some of those experiences for definite good in your life. Doesn't mean that he wanted all that suffering for you, but he's promised, that's again promised in Romans 8, he's promised to use even that pain that you've been going through and to use it for good in your life. Thirdly, the day is coming when suffering will cease and God will judge evil. This will end. The heartache and the grief and and all the stuff of this world will come to an end at some point in time, and God will judge. Fourthly, our suffering will pale in comparison to what God has in store for his followers. I don't think we understand heaven. Uh, Most of us still question whether it's really there, right? You know, what's going to happen? How can we understand and comprehend all of this that there's this incredible universe beyond all of what we see here and we move from here to there in a moment in a twinkling in an eye of the flash with the trumpet sound of the, and the calling of the Lord or, or when the angel that comes there or when Jesus meets us and he says, it's time to come home. In that moment, that's when things are going to change and then we'll maybe finally understand because then we'll be fully known. Now we see in part, but then we, will see, we shall see how. Oh, I love it see face to face now we know in part (laughs) and we think we've got it all knowledge but then we shall be what fully known (laughs) number five we decide whether to turn bitter or turn to god for peace and courage we decide that you make the choice are you going to hold on to what somebody else has done and allow that bitterness to ruin you? Are you going to carry their garbage around? Because I'm, I'm going to tell you that if somebody's done something to hurt you, they dumped the garbage on you a long time ago. You, you've been carrying the yucky, smelly, stinky trash. They're not. And as we choose to not forgive somebody else, as we choose to hold on to anger and bitterness, we give a root and a foothold to whom? Satan in our lives. We have the choice of whether we're going to turn bitter or whether we're going to allow God to give us the peace that he wants to give us, a peace that goes beyond understanding, a peace that is, that is beyond measure, a peace that, that, that will touch our hearts and carry us through the most painful moments if we'll allow God to do that. 2 Peter 3.9 says, The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. No, instead... He is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. Paul said it in Romans 8. In in the earlier part of the chapter, he says, Romans 8, verse 18, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. Paul's getting ready to die, folks. He's hurting. And he says, I, I'm considering something really better that's ahead. 
Second, First Corinthians chapter two, verse nine. Uh, someone said, "Let this soak into your soul." So let this soak in. No eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived what God has prepared for those who love Him. Let's soak in. No eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind can conceive what God has in store for those who love him. The clay can't say to the (laughs) potter, why are you doing what you're doing? And yet, there are appropriate moments when we need to take our questions to God. As we end up our worship today, I'd like to ask you, do you have questions you need to ask God? Now be careful. Don't get indignant and rude. (laughs) But what would you like to ask God? What do you struggle with that you'd like to ask God? I'd like... And this includes those who might be watching on the internet. I'd just like you to... Examine yourself. Have you told the potter what to do? Everybody just close your eyes. I don't want anyone looking at anyone else right now. If you've told the potter what to do and you want to simply admit that to him and ask him to take complete control of every part of your life, would you just raise your hand to him? God, you see our hands. And Lord, we are sincere in our desire for you to be the the one who molds this clay, even though there's times we're probably going to grab it back. We're going to try to tell you what to do, and we apologize for that, God. It's our human way. It's our way of sin. It's our pride that gets in the way. It's our ego, God. We apologize. We admit it. And right now, God, instead, though, We sincerely ask for you to lead us, for you to take control of our lives. We want to submit to you. If you've never said yes to Jesus, you can put your hands down now. If you've never said yes to Jesus, never said, Jesus, I want want that full relationship with you, would you just raise your hand right now? Now, Jesus, come in. You fill up to overflowing those who are saying, I've never committed my life to you, but here I am. God, I thank you that you're the one who does the work. You're the one who has been calling us to you. You're the one who fills us up with your spirit to be your followers. And so for these who have just raised their hands now, God, bless them. Anoint them. Fill them up. May they know all the blessings of your love, your forgiveness, your cleansing. In Jesus' name, amen. You are the potter and we are the clay. So may God go out and mold and shape and use you for his purposes. To him be the glory and praise today and forevermore. God bless you.